uh, how much more starstruck would you be if you were working with Jim Morrison on this? I'd, I'd just be dead on the floor, that's it. I'd just be... <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome back to the Comics Cube. Today I am with Leah Moore. Hi Leah, Hi. how are you? I'm great, thanks. Thanks for having me. I hope uh, everything's okay. Um, so uh, I reached out to you because I got hit by an ad on Facebook that you are working on a comic book anthology of one of my favorite bands ever, The Doors. Yes, yes I am. Yeah, I, I can't believe it either. I keep getting those um those ads. They pop up on Instagram and I'm like, oh, that looks good. Oh my God, I'm writing it. Oh, I haven't finished writing it. Oh my God, <laughs> stop looking at Instagram and keep typing. But yes, I'm still pinching myself about that. It's, um, I'm so excited. I Like, yeah, excited doesn't even cover it. People keep saying to me, how does it feel to be working with the doors about it? I'm like, I... I've mentally blocked that I'm working with the doors about it just so that I don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my next question. What, what is it like working with uh, Robbie Krieger and John Densmore? I've, I've had a very exciting little bit of back and forth about some of the stories and um, it just, it's amazing. It feels like the problem when you're, when you're adapting something or um, you always wonder, you know, I've done like, adaptations of mr james and i've done you know sherlock holmes things and you think oh am i am i remaining true to the like the original spirit of it and you don't usually have the person actually there like to worry about do you know what i mean you think you know at least arthur conan doyle he's dead he can't like sit up and say to me that's not how i would have like sherlock speak about this or yeah but i i really am um, yeah it's it's a tremendous honor and it's really um it's really good fun there's such um morrison hotel has got such a good mixed um selection of songs to adapt as well it's just perfect it's, it means that it's it really feels like an anthology i was worried that if it was just me writing them that it would just be oh more of this but each each track that i've done has been completely different so yeah i'm dead excited uh safe to say you were starstruck working with these guys yes really i used to i was i've been a fan of the doors since i was like 15 or 16 or something like 100 amazingly i used to have a, the the um archetypal enormous picture of jim morrison on my wall and like so i one? made my bed yeah the yes yeah. the enormous one and but i you know put up fairy lights so my bedroom was like the like the cave in lost boys that was like i was like that is just decor goals like <laughs> a big horrible haunted cave full of trash with a big picture of jim morrison and some fairy lights i was like that is my my aesthetic so yeah no i've i've been a huge fan of theirs and like i've oh i've been into you know rock music and everything since i was like 15 or 16 so the the doors are like yeah i yeah starstruck doesn't cover it at all so let me ask you uh, how much more starstruck would you be if you were working with Jim Morrison on this? I'd, I'd just be dead on the floor. That's it. I'd just be... <laughs> no, it's a good job I'm not, because otherwise I'd just be... Yeah. Let's not even think about that. Uh, what do you think it is so about... It's weird, though, because... Yeah. You go. No, I was just going to say, it feels, it feels like I am, because I'm having to adapt the lyrics and because I'm going into the lyrics and researching the kind of ideas behind them and stuff. I like, um, I've had moments where I'm like, oh, that's what he was talking about with that, like uh, moments where it just kind of, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go so far as to say, well, I, well, actually I am working with Jim Morrison, but I, I like, I, I, when obviously Robbie Krieger's lyrics, Jim Morrison's lyrics, they're really, um, they're sort of dense and evocative and you have to unpick the meanings of them quite like carefully and, I, yeah, I hope, I hope I've put my own stamp on it, but, um, yeah. What, what do you think it is about the doors that make it so timeless? Because you're, you uh, my brother is around the same age as you and the doors is, mm -hmm. are also his favorite band. But the thing yeah. is, 
the doors were done long before you guys were born. And yeah. so what do you think it is about, and, and now you're coming out with, with, a, with a, a comic about them for, for Morrison Hotel's uh, anniversary. What do you think about the door, it is about the doors that makes them so timeless? I think it's because they weren't pretending. They weren't pretending to be, there's a lot of bands that you, um, that you hear and you can kind of, you can hear the influences on them and you can hear the kind of things that they are, they're wanting to sound like, or, um, you know, the lyrics can come across as like, um, hitting a certain market or a certain tone, whereas like nothing sounds like the doors. I don't think there's, they're so, um, I was thinking about this the other day, they sort of, you get the feeling that they've been somewhere, you know, then it's not just that they're kind of um, constructing something for um, mass market appeal. They are on some kind of journey with their, with their music and their poetry and their art and their kind of, um, you know, spiritual, whatever kind of psychedelic journey that they were on. It was authentic. And I think that's what makes it timeless. I think that you, um, they, they don't sound like they're posing. They, you know, Jim Morrison, you know, when he's singing, he's not just kind of, you know, oh, well, you know, this, this will probably sell loads or, you know, he's not, he's not thinking about the, the market or the, he's doing it because uh, he's putting something of himself into it. And I think all four of them did that to a, a massive extent. You can like, you know, I've, I've never, uh, it, possibly it's because I've been obsessively re-listening to the album over and over again as I've been doing it, but they each one of them puts as much as they can of their artistry into it. And I know most bands, you know, they try not to, they want to do a good job, but I just mean that like um, John Densmore's drum fills or drum kind of um, line that he takes is really, it's it, he bounces his drums from like what Jim is doing in the vocals and Ray's keyboards are kind of, he's, um, they, he's kind of balancing up Robbie Krieger's uh, like guitars and it, it just, they, um, they put a lot into it. And I think that's the, um, that's the thing that makes them timeless is that they're, they are, um, what you hear is what they're like, they're putting everything into it. I think like, I don't know if that makes sense. Speaking of, speaking of timeless, um, I've read that you, as you were work, I mean, I saw it on SDCC. As you were working on this comic, you're realizing how much of it has to do with the current day. Yeah, I am. Um, I thought that it was going to be. I knew it was going to be a lot of research because I knew that we wanted to place it in the the year that it was being worked on and the year that it came out, which is 1969. And 1969 is like, you know, the you know the year that the 60s died. You know, everybody is a lot of um you know civil unrest there's a lot of uh, environmentalism sort of issues are coming up there's the, you know the sort of whole kind of hate ashbury hippie movement was kind of at its peak and then there was the sort of charlie manson stuff and all the kind of so there was kind of um researching it has kind of been okay what do i find that is archetypally 60s and like the most 60s thing and every single one of them I'm like well that's exactly the same as now that is what we're still looking at now we're still kind of you know the the um the people's park is one of the stories that I've I've um done which was a uh, a park in Berkeley campus where they you know they wanted to, the students there was an old broken car park that they wanted to make a park in and they got a load of volunteers together all the students and everybody brought plants and you know materials and they built a park and it was like a community park with swings and flowers and you know a park and the governor um, of California at the time is Ronald Reagan and the basically the he, he hated hippies he he really hated hippies like they were you you wouldn't think anybody could hate a hippie because they're just kind of you know peaceful you know they're fairly innocuous but he was frothing mad about them and he sent in the like um the national guard and they smashed up the park 
and put a big hurricane fence around it and um, there was a huge student outcry and a big demonstration and they sent in the National Guard with fixed bayonets, tear gas, like and all the stuff that you see now with Black Lives Matter or with, you know, the, the overreaction and the kind of brutality of it, the military brutality against just ordinary people, ordinary American, you know, these are kids, they're 18 year old kids. They're like, their parents had obviously saved up to send them off to college and they get to college and they get their head stoved in by a policeman. So it's like, it's really like, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that really, rings bells and I hope that I mean I haven't tried to sort of like um go on about it too much but I just I hope that there's stuff that people can find resonances with with their like with what's happening now I hope it's I'm packing it in can you tell it's, <laughs> it's been a, it's 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 disturbing especially since the image of Ronald Reagan in my head is you know yeah the guy who falls asleep at presidential meetings and <laughs> exactly that was my that was my i was thinking oh bumbly old ronald reagan who's just kind of like you know a, a joke um but when i found um i have i've had to look at so much footage on youtube and i found him giving a speech i forget if it was a, like um if it was a rally or something it was it was some a speech of his and he's so angry and it's when he's really young and he's so angry and so ferocious and he's talking about um you know about hippies and saying like oh well you know they um they don't wash they're like they're dirty they're like immoral they're like he's completely furious about it and you just think you know what is wrong obviously it's the threat to the 1950s um you know the yeah. the boom of you know the, the, production and jobs and the economy and he's like they're dropping out they're rejecting american values they're rejecting you know um capitalist ideals and but he was he's livid and it's it's um the but his the rhetoric that he's using and the is so familiar um with just the the nonsense that's coming out of the White House at the moment it's really kind of um angry kind of hate fueling um language that is seems only to sort of he just wants everybody to be fighting each other so it's um it's some of it is really um yeah it's a bit it's, it's on the nose if i was going to write sort of a, a, a fiction about a place that was like the 60s or like now like a dystopia yeah. it's that's it's a bit on the nose yeah i mean if you decided you were going to write a fictional piece about the 60s and you made it about uh go like that a lot of people would actually criticize you for for being too too on the nose about today's society yeah if, if yeah, why have you shoehorned in all of these like political opinions of yours? And, and they're literally that is what was happening. And it's um, you know, stuff to do with like feminism, stuff to do with um, you know, sort of the philosophical ideas or the sort of stuff to do with religion. It's it's incredible. But um, that's what I mean when I say that the doors are kind of they feel genuine. Is that they? It feels like a a valid genuine response to that society they you know they're not just kind of off in a sort of psychedelic bubble i know that um you know robbie krieger and john densmore always say that they weren't they never set out to be political but you know there's there's always been the saying that you know the the, the personal is political you you the things the the ways that they are breaking out of the mold the ways that they are you know talking about um you know expanding your consciousness or kind of um they are they're inherently political they are they are rejecting you know normal everyday white collar america with every breath so mm -hmm. you know like as much as they might not have wanted to, they're not bob dylan sat there you know singing about whatever but they're yeah it's it's that kind of rejection of everything rejection of common sense in a lot of cases i think the the more videos i watch about of, of jim morrison on stage and it's just like he's absolutely um out of control but completely in in control of himself do you know what i mean like he's it's um it's a i think that's the um 
that's the thing I love about it. It's the fine balance that they, they the fine line they walked between total chaos and I'm sure some of their shows did result in total chaos and and like amazing control and genius and it's that kind of there every time you think that it's going to slip into like just absolute an awful horror show then it, they they pull it back and it's just oh it it's that it's that tension i think between chaos and an order that makes them kind of that makes them special speaking of their shows becoming total chaos 1969 uh was the year of the miami incident Yes. Yeah. Yes, which, which I think you know, if you if you read half the articles, they're about like that. He, apparently, he just kind of got it out in the middle of the of the concert. But uh, actually, the the I've read I've read the court reports. The um the there was a, a photographer in the in the like press area, such as it was, which was like they got three guys with cameras to come and stand near the front, which you know it was really disorganized but he was right there right at the front with his camera taking pictures of Jim Morrison and he said he never saw anything so I mean he had a front row kind of he would have <laughs> if he had anybody got pictures then it would have been him so um <laughs> yeah it's but the the actual incident itself I think um Jim had been to see the living theater perform um, I think the night before or the week before or something, and they were like um, sort of uh, confrontational, you know, uh, boundary destroying theatre company where they would come in into the audience and they would interact with the audience. And it was kind of, it wasn't so much a theatrical performance as like a, as a, an experience for the, for the everybody in the room. So I think that Jim was basically sort of, um, he was frustrated by the feeling of being up on stage and performing for an audience because it feels he I think what he was into it for was the the shared experience and that connection with the audience and the band and the the fact that um, a performer can put their audience into like a um, you know one frame of mind or they can um, you know influence how they're feeling or how what they're thinking about and I think he, he'd been to see the living theatre and thought in his rather like drunk state, he's like, yes, this would be a fantastic idea if I urge all like 10,000 of them or whatever up onto the stage. And obviously, you know, it was um, a debacle, but I can sort of, I can see where he's coming from. I can see that like Miami was such a, it was a horrible gig anyway, because they'd, um, they'd, the people that owned you know were putting it on had paid the doors for a seated gig and then they pulled all the seats out and sold another twice as many tickets mm -hmm. and they stuffed the whole auditorium full so it was like it was a nightmarish kind of like one of the seven circles of hell before Jim Morrison got into the picture so like the fact that he turned up and like <laughs> did that I just think well they, they had it coming really because you know that's what you get I mean, if we're being fair, it wasn't the biggest debacle of a rock show that year. Altamont was the same. No. <laughs> wasn't well, the same exactly. Year. Yeah, and I've, oh my God. I, do you know, I just, Altamont makes me really, like, oh, it makes me angry in a mum way. You know, because I've got, I've got three young boys and I spend my entire time telling them not to do things because they're going to hurt themselves or each other or don't balance that on top of that because it's going to fall over and like a basic common sense i repeat it over and over and over every day like don't hit your brother with that you're going to hurt him altamont i'm just like i am furious with mick jagger i mean if he wants to come come talk to me about it i'm furious that like the the lack of health and safety of on a really basic level i'm just and that's without the piles of acid that everybody was on and the hell's angels. And it's just, oh my God. You know, when you just like, everybody's been to sort of badly organized gigs in their lifetime where you're just like, this is, this is like not acceptable. Somebody needs to have a word and you know, there needs to be standards, but Altamont and you just think, 
as was there a point in the afternoon where the crowds kept piling in and people started to sweat and think oh god we can't stop them now we're gonna have to just go through with it or you know it's just yeah it's the stuff of nightmares so i'm hopefully i'm gonna be bringing that to you <laughs> in the form of a comic so yeah it's um yeah i haven't done that one yet i'm still in the research on that one but um yeah horrific just horrific it makes me not want my kids to go to a festival ever <laughs> <laughs> Don't go to festivals, no. <laughs> Speaking of the yeah. comic, of course. Um, so you say that you'll be adapting some of the Morrison Hotel songs, but you'll also be doing the history of the doors. How's that going to work? I think basically I've got, I can't even remember how many, how many stories I've got in it. I think there's about 14 stories and some of them are just straight adaptations where they're kind of um, uh, just sort of what, what suggests itself to me but most of them I've tried to put an angle on it where it's something to do with a big thing in the 60s so the People's Park or Altamont or um, there's I've tried to kind of put as much of the as much of the history in as I can and still keep the um, uh, keep it sort of fictional in a way so I'm uh, which, and because they're all different, I've done that to varying degrees. So one of them I've got is um, in Vietnam. And mm. that's basically, it's a sort of straightforward war comic, like of, like the sort of two-fisted tales or whatever from EC or, um, and I, uh, so that's, it's, it's exciting and it's, I'm managing to put some historic stuff into it, but um, it's not actually physically based on the, the lyrics. So I haven't, it, it's hard to explain. Basically, I've done it. I've approached it in as many ways as there are songs. So no, no two of them feel the same. And like one of them is just kind of a really nice visual um, noodlings of what what occurred to my to my brain when I when I was listening to the song. Some of them are okay. He's talking about these issues, so we're going to set it here, and we're going to have these people involved, and it's going to be. Um, so I've tried to, I've tried to mix it up so that, because it's, it's such a mixed album, I just didn't want, I wanted to make sure that each song was, was different. And I'm lucky enough that I get as many artists as there are songs. So I get to like do different styles of, styles of story for them. So. Yeah, so some of the some of the production material has said it's a history of the doors, but it's not. It's like a, it's the history stuff is historical in the sixties. It's not necessarily all about the doors. Not necessarily. Oh, there's a lot of their personal there's a lot of their history from that year as well. The the Miami incident mm -hmm. or um, them like had their tour cancelled. So they just they were putting out um uh softed. And they had a huge tour planned to um, promote it, sell loads of copies and, you know, they, they needed money on it and they needed to recoup that money, the label needed to, like, make it a success. And all of a sudden, after my, all of their shows were cancelled, I think like, John Densmore or Robbie Krieger or someone said it was a million pounds worth of, a million dollars worth of shows that have been cancelled. So they've got suddenly they've got no work for the year they've got no like money coming in they've got huge studio bills in like high dudgeon because he's got this court thing for him and they've got to i think that that is really the story of the album is that um despite all of that like you know march april kind of the the beginning of the year um the end of the year they'd they had done gigs. They did. Um, they did the Aquarium Theatre. They did, which was in LA, which was like home turf, so they could always get gigs there. But they did a couple of shows there that were recorded for the live albums. There was um, shows in New York that they recorded, and they they managed to scrape together a load of. They did uh, gigs in Mexico, I think, and they did. Mm. Um, where else did they play? Did they play. Las Vegas, I can't remember. But they did they managed to get together enough gig Toronto, the Toronto Rock and Roll Festival. Um so they did they did enough gigs um to kind of 
you know, fill the year up. And they managed to pull together Morrison Hotel, which I think is actually like one of their best one of albums in terms of its kind of back to basics. Um, you know, it's good stomping like rock and roll that you that you kind of you might not expect from them in that late in their career you might expect them to off on their like experimental you know journey and um indulge in themselves but it's really it's it's a good a proper barnstormer of an album so yeah they managed to pull that out of the mess they'd left themselves in and in, in you know the beginning of the year so i think that that's that's the story of the book is that they went through all of that and came out of it creatively with an amazing chord and i think that that's quite um given the times and what was happening and what was happening with them personally i think that was really unlikely uh, mm -hmm. like you know if you'd said to them oh don't worry you know you'll you'll have this at the end of it i don't think any um, believed you so um I, personally speaking i'm glad it's this album it, this is actually my favorite doors album so <laughs> i'm i'm glad that uh yeah. this is the one this is the one that you ended up working on uh going back to the very beginning of it how did you get this gig i think um i got it because the um the editor Hans hosley uh, he has edited me a couple of times before and um, I did a story for his comic tattoo. You know, he won Eisner, Eisner and mm -hmm. he's, um, that's based on Tori Amos's music. And I think he liked how I'd approached that. And I've, I've done some other stuff with him um, since. So I think he just thought that, and I think because I post a load of like, I'm, I'm a nineties, nineties rock girl so I think he just thought that it might be right up my street and I took his arm off when he suggested it so. <laughs> and also um, are you at liberty to say who the artists are I don't know if I am you know because I haven't had a um, official um, thing from on high about it but um, I don't know I think I think the only one that I've actually I've actually said about is um, Colleen Duran is doing one of the stories, and I there is Colleen Duran is one of those artists that you just oh my god she's amazing and I've 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 edited her before I did a project and I edited her but I haven't actually um, written for her and I was so nervous I just thought she's so good she's so you know the um, snow glass apples that she's had out with Neil Gaiman recently yeah. like when you look at it it's mind-bending what she's done with a comics page so that I wrote her stories kind of with that in mind because I thought I want to play to her strengths I want her to kind of be able to show off her you know amazing powers <laughs> well, so yeah that I'm really excited and when I've got pages like pages in my inbox and it's like Oh yeah, I just thought you might want to see this page I'm working on today, and I'm. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. How does it feel? How does it feel to be working with Colleen Duran? Is it as starstrucky as working with Robbie it's... Krieger? <laughs> well, yeah. I just, I think that um, I don't think I'm ever going to get over that. I think I'm just going to like. The thing is, I think most comic professionals are comic fans first. So they've all got kind of the, the comics and the people that they, you know, that they really are excited about as they, you know, and I think that, um, you know, another, I'm, oh, if, if this is a horrendous faux pas and I leak this without, but I'm, I'm also right, right, Jill Thompson on it. I've got a story with Jill Thompson and she's like, I met her years ago, like back in 2007, I think we were both at a convention in Portugal and she's the nicest person ever. She's the, I'd, oh, like, we got the, um, the scary godmother and, you know, but like, she's just the nicest person and I couldn't, I can't believe that she's doing it. So, yeah, starstruck. I'm permanently starstruck. I just wonder about at conventions going, like, I can't believe it.
if uh, Colleen Duran and Jill Thompson are uh, uh, indications of what's on what's on the uh, comic, that's going to be, you know, I'm really looking forward to it as it is. Uh, yeah. um, you you won't be disappointed. It's amazing. I don't doubt it, and it's coming out in two editions. Is that? Yes, yes. The I'm. Um, there's the the limited edition that's with the the vinyl um, mm -hmm. repressing. I'm just, I'm so excited for that. I think it's, um, I, because I've, I've really realized, you know, um, we got, I got my husband a, a record deck a couple of years back for a birthday and we were listening to um, a load of old, like he's got a load of old like eighties metal albums and we've got a load of his mum and dad's Beatles albums and things. And when you listen to things on vinyl, it's just so, um, warm and rich and kind of i don't know i don't know i don't know enough yeah. about the science of it but <laughs> the physics of it but it's um it definitely sounds sounds great and uh this is out in october right? yeah. yeah um exact date i'm going to be putting it in my in the description under the youtube video okay um so thank you i'm really looking forward to to the Morrison Hotel comic. I've got a few uh, music related comics. It's kind of like, there's not a lot of music related comics out there. Yes, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to, to this one. Um, and now I also just wanted to take the time to thank you for Wild Girl. So thank you and John for, for Wild Girl, which was a comic I bought um, off the stands like, not when it was coming out, but like soon after it came out. And I shared it with my then four-year-old niece. Um, so it's a comic that brought us closer together. Uh, do you have any fond yeah. memories of that, uh, of uh, Wild Girl? Yeah, but that was our first ever. Um, I, I've, people always say like, you know, sort of how did you get into comics? And I had a really backwards way of doing it. So I started off with two eight-page stories for... Um, Tom Strong's Terrific Tales mm -hmm. um, and then Scott Dumbier said okay pitch me a, a, a series pitch me a series what would you write for a series and so me and John went off and went what would we do oh it would have it would be a girl who can you know get animals powers and talk to them and have you know mythical animal adventures and you know the um, basically it was uh, that was our first thing that we ever wrote. We'd never, I'd never written anything longer than eight paid before. And suddenly I had a six issue series to fill and no idea of how to write for it. So that one, like when I read it back now, I'm like, oh, wow. Like it's, it's incredible that I managed to get it, to, that it turned out so well for saying how, what a noob I was for writing comics. So I, I, I'm so glad to hear that you, um, that you and your niece enjoyed it. We we wrote it thinking there aren't enough girl characters, there aren't enough female characters, and there aren't characters that would make little girls be interested in comics. And you know what? Um, yeah, we we we're basically both me and me and John are both really interested in folklore and mythology and mm -hmm. kind of um, you know folk stories and. Uh, you, all the kind of um, and there's so many of those are about animals so it was wonderful we got to, my favorite part of wild girl is that we got to um we had jim williams who is yeah. one of my favorite favorite artists he did the little um uh, eight page little vignettes in the middle of each you so we got to try out a different style because jim is one of those artists where he just he he's like a weird chameleon he, he can just do anything so uh, we got to try out different styles with him and different different stories and oh i'm i'm so the, my only one of my only sadnesses in comics is that wild girl never got a collected edition because i think that if that was on the stands now i think it would stand up against any of the i think it would be you know um popular still it's so, ahead of its time that maybe comics Exactly, yeah. yeah, comics for girls. And now everybody, I can remember doing um, 
panels at conventions and they'd be like so what's it like being a woman in comics and it was it, we were like a novelty panel it would be a women in comics panel and can you imagine that now like rounding up all of the women that are currently working in comics and sticking them up behind one table and saying what's it like being a woman in comics and at the time we all just kind of like looked at each other awkwardly and kind of went oh well um it's fine you know like it's it's just comics but like and now i think that you would have like blistering political polemic <laughs> about exactly what it's like being a woman in comics and i think also you would have you know like uh, back in sort of 2000 and god when was it 2004 or something when we started when, like when we started writing wild girl and i didn't have kelly sue deconic to kind of like i didn't know that that was possible I was just like, oh, if I can just write a little story and, you know, so now I think that, that there's a whole generation of young women writers and artists that have come up since I've been in it. And I'm like, how, how are they so good? They're fresh out of college and they're just incredible. And, you know, they're writing and drawing and like, I, it's, it's so exciting. So yeah, I, since Wild Girl, then things have changed. But I would, yeah, I obviously I'd like to think that we were just ahead of the curve and like, you know, spotting the, the coming wave of um, comics feminism. It, it was, because uh, it, it, uh, it fills a niche, right? Um, it's, yeah. it, it was very much in demand. I, personally speaking, uh, I grew up in a co-ed school and I had, uh, I had female, I had like a lot of close female friends. I'd say like half my closest friends are, fem are, are women and half are, are guys. And I just tried to get them into comics so much growing up and I just couldn't do it. And I feel like if, if we had the, 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 the range of comics that we had now, like, you know, since Wild Girl, like it would have been much yeah. easier to do. Yeah, so. yeah, there'd have been things people don't see until you got like Kamala Khan being Ms. Marvel. Then you go, when you see that and you just go, oh, there is zero representation. There is like, why would anybody pick up a comic that is just sort of a couple of like overly muscled white guys thumping each other if they're you know what we there has to be something that is going to grab you into that story and yeah sometimes beautiful art will still grab you and you know sometimes um i have to say you know when people say like the dark knight is like uh you know one of the one of the pinnacles of you know comic book kind of that, that 80s like um, resurgence of, of comics and you think the Dark Knight, the reason why the Dark Knight grabbed me was because Robin was a girl with great big glasses and at the time I was a 10 year old girl with really thick glasses and really like and I was like oh, even, a, even a nerdy girl like me could be Robin and so like never mind the amazing you know Lim Varley's amazing colours or Frank Miller's amazing art or the, like the re- you know imagining of batman i was i was just like but robin's a girl that's like that's important and it's um i think that now you've got um there's there's so far still to go you know i don't think anything is even remotely fixed but i do think that at least it's quest there are questions that people feel they can they if women sit on a panel now they can have a conversation about representation and about what is actually you know what comics they would buy and what movies they would go and see and what games they play and you can just you know crack on make make what makes you happy make what speaks to you and it'll speak to other people so yeah i'm, I I'm very glad to say that we're in a, a much better you if you underestimate you know, beetle mania you could argue right you could argue that the entire kind of um western music kind of it was changed forever by Beatlemania, but all Beatlemania was was really, really intensely um, fanish girls. Like men like the Beatles, but the women were the ones running after the cars, screaming, and the hype. The hype is how much how much can you make a massive amount of women love your product? If a massive amount of women love your product, you become the Beatles or the doors or you know like you i think that to underestimate the like the power of um 
women to get behind something and really push it, I think is just, I think it's foolish. <laughs> speaking of, uh, speaking of fandoms, it is arguable that modern fandom started, the, the modern type of fandom started with Sherlock Holmes. Right? Yes, so. I agree. Definitely. <laughs> um, yeah. So you wrote a couple oh, you of mean the actual Sherlock Holmes, like the yeah, um, because like the like way the, yeah, not mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> actual Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> um, so yeah. because uh, you know they you had they had a fan club, the Basker uh, the Baskerville Irregulars. Um, no, the Baker Street Irregulars. Baker sorry. Street. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah. And uh, they 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 nitpicked continuity, and they they wrote letters to to Conan Doyle, so it's yeah. very reminiscent of today's fandom. Um, you wrote a yeah. couple of Sherlock Holmes stories for Dynamite. How difficult is it to to plant clues for a mystery story in a twenty page comic or a or five issues of a twenty page comic? It's hard. The um, the actually the the Sherlock Holmes books that we did for for Dynamite are, are one of my favourite things we've ever written. They mm -hmm. they're the most fun. They're the most fun for me to read back now. Um, our first one that we did, um, the the trial of Sherlock Holmes. I we nearly melted our brains trying to write that one because exactly what you're saying. When you read one of the little Sherlock Holmes stories from that were originally in the Strand magazine, they're quite short, and uh, he does have a habit of making um, Holmes make deductions based on things that you haven't been told yourself in the text. So Sherlock Holmes will notice things that you're kind of um, obviously he hasn't said a text, or you know the there is a a loose thread on his coat or something so you think oh, okay well Sherlock Holmes is genius so he notices all these little clues and then he puts them together and then at the end of it he tells you who's who's done it um in a comic you have to show things you can't just you somebody's not going to sit and read a comic and then have you go oh and actually I um I noticed that the the car was facing a different direction you know, like the, the his coat on backwards, or you can't have something and not have actually seen it. So we had to plant, um, we had to plant things in plain sight, um, and then hide them. So there is um, a gunshot that is hidden in the lettering, on in that first issue of um, mm -hmm. the trial of Sherlock Holmes. So when you read it the first time, you won't notice it. When you go back to look for it, you'll be like, okay that's there's there's the gunshot but we had to try and there's things like that where we were like this is comics you can't there's nowhere to hide you have to show it in the art and you have to describe it to the artist say to them you have to draw it this way but don't make it too obvious like it, honest to god we nearly broke our brains there was a point as well where um we we decided that what we would in our infinite wisdom as experienced comic writers, that what we would do is write the first issue as the most amazing cliffhanger, like, oh my God, this is impossible. They are never going to solve this. This is amazing. And then work out how it was done after that. Oh, so wow. We basically went, here's the first issue. What we, we, we said, we're going to have to write our way out of it because we thought if we didn't, then it wouldn't be it wouldn't grab people enough that first issue we thought we'd we'd tone it down or we'd put too many clues in or we'd make it too obvious or we'd somehow we'd like make it too i think to be honest i think we were wrong to do it because we'd actually like issue three there was a point where me and john were sat there trying to work out how to write issue three and we're like we, there is no way, there is no way that this, <laughs> that this is going to work. We've done a, we had a real like crisis of like um, confidence on it. And then the penny dropped and we found a way to make it work. And then the rest of the story got, springs up and goes, oh, that makes sense. That, we tie it up this way 
and the mystery works as a structure with the with the setup and the neat ending and the all the stuff in between but the yeah issue three um I think we actually shed tears of alarm and regret over it like just while we were writing it we were like what have we done so I think um I would never suggest that a writer did anything as foolish as writing a complex mystery story and not knowing how it was done like um but yeah that was the the fun of of writing Sherlock Holmes is that he's he's um he's a brilliant detective so he can figure stuff out if you give him those things the problem with writing him is is that he's like superman the problem of writing superman is that he can do anything and solve anything straight away so back in like the 40s when he's on the other side of the world and he hears somebody's trapped under a train and he whooshes over and lifts the train that's exciting and dramatic it's like imagine if there was a man who could lift a train and now writers are going well, if he can fly to the other side of the world, listen with his superhero hearing train, like you can't have a character that can do everything straight away because as a writer, you're like, well, they, how do they just do that straight away? So the reason why Sherlock Holmes spends a good portion of the trial of Sherlock Holmes in prison is because we had to put him somewhere so he couldn't get out and mm -hmm. detect everything. You know, you can't have him roaming about being a genius because otherwise he just, you'd only have a, like, you know, two issue comic. It would be too, too easy. So, yeah. Can I, can I tell another small anecdote about uh, you bringing me and my family closer together? Go on. So this is, uh, this was their Christmas gift to me last year. It's Sherlock Holmes oh, Punishment. Amazing. And I found out while preparing Yay. for this interview that you and John worked on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we uh, we got asked to come up with some of the cases for it, mm -hmm. and we had to. Um, it was a really good exercise, actually. For um, we we got asked to pitch about, I think it was twelve cases each, and we just had to send a little paragraph of a Sherlock Holmes story. And a complete, like a, you know, just a kind of the the boiled down synopsis of a Sherlock Holmes story, which meant that me and John sat down and went, right, 12 Sherlock Holmes mysteries, what would you do? And how would you make it have a snappy title? And how would you make it something that would be exciting to game through? And how would you, it'd have to be right for the period, it'd have to be something that he might get involved in and it was um yeah we'd we'd felt pretty pleased with ourselves for coming up with the three books that we did for dynamite because we um we had the the trial of sherlock holmes and we had the liverpool demon mm -hmm. um and then we had the um the vanishing man which is the most recent one and but when we sat down to do the stuff for the game we came up with 10 each and sent them off and they just picked which ones they thought would work best in the you know what they could like create an environment for and that had the right amount of clues for you to kind of go through how far through it are you have you played um have you played our levels yet uh actually we 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 did um yeah which ones i i don't uh, think we I have, did yeah. um we did the one set in the roman baths that was one of ours. Okay. Um, you might not be, but um, yes, there's, it's, it's very exciting. Also, I'd forgotten that I'd put one of my friend's names in as a, as a, like, writers quite often, you know, we all use people's names, that, like people that we know, but like, it stayed in there. So there's like an archaeologist friend of mine whose name's Paul Blinkhorn and his name crops up as the archaeologist in this and it was so surprised like i was sat there playing it and it was like <laughs> he, he the guy actually shows up with like his like victorian archaeologist outfit on and everything it's too cute but yeah i think we um we had to stop working on it it was um because i had twins yeah. so i was i kept sending them emails and saying we've got to get going I'm gonna have twins any minute and then 
finally it was like two days before we were due to have the boys and I was like I'm sorry guys I don't want to let you down but I, what can you <laughs> what can you do with twins so um yeah yeah I wish we'd done more of that it was good fun I read about that um okay uh, uh there is there is a comic book uh, that exists that brings together a lot of Victorian super uh, uh, I was going to say superheroes Victorian classic characters and uh, it by conspicuous by his absence Sherlock Holmes is not one of the team members I am of course talking about League of Extraordinary Gentlemen which was written by your mm-hmm. dad and yes. um, I just want to give you the platform to kind of just set the record straight about your dad based on what you wrote last year on Twitter after he implored everyone to vote because he said he was voting for the first time in forever. I, I yeah. think he gets a bad rap yeah. on the internet. So, Yeah, he does. He does. And to be honest, it's kind of, um, uh, I think quite a lot of that comes around the, is from him asking for his name to be taken off of books. And um, he's kind of, that has given him, I think people think of him as kind of stroppy and petulant and kind of, oh, where does he get off? Who does he think he is? You know, asking for this, and throwing his weight about and saying all this stuff. And I think that um, all he has ever asked for is that he um, gets his, his IP back he you know he for for watchmen a lot of um his early contracts but particularly watchmen he believed based on what he'd been told by the publishers that he was going to get it back once it went out of publication and that was the once it you know the print run was finished then he'd get it back and he did not know that it was never gonna go out of print Mm -hmm. and there was a point at which it could have been they could have given it back to him and he could have, they would have still made money from it and he would have still made money from it. And it would have, there is a very strong possibility that if it had all been by the books, like as he was expecting it to happen, that he would have gone on, continued working with them and continued working in comics cheerfully. Because to be honest, right up until that, you know, all the convention pictures of him, from when he was like, you know, he was 25 when he did Watchmen. So he was a kid, you know what I mean? He's, mm-hmm. he, he was really young. And you think um, the pictures of him from conventions, he's sat cheerfully signing and chatting to people. He is the loveliest, friendliest, most enthusiastic, nerdy, passionate fella. He is so like, honest to god the reason why i'm in comics i think is because he spent my entire childhood and teenage years like bending my ear about the genius of wally wood and will eisner and harvey kurtzman and you know uh, you know bob kane and all the like all of the things that he was so passionate about as a as a kid and i mean he he got into comics when he had to go to like a second hand stall in in Northampton, some tiny little pokey place. And they would sometimes have the American comics that had come over, but there wasn't there wasn't any regularity to it. He just he could only buy them sporadically. And he didn't have loads of money because it like they had almost nothing. So he would spend his money on these on Marvel comics. And I have his Marvel comics. He gave them to me. He said, you know, like, have these and see what... I've got them. And they're not pristine, beautiful, like, editions. They are absolutely, like... They look like they've been in a box under somebody's bed for... You know, they're not... (laughs) They're not, like... um, he, He didn't treasure them. He read them and devoured them. And, like, you know, uh, they are well thumbed and i think that his kind of passion for comics has never been reverential of like this is the holy grail this is the like this is this pristine thing like watchmen people a lot of people have watchmen or or that kind of era as like 
oh well that's a that is a graphic novel that is a proper comic and they see the the rest of them but he's he has always been completely passionate about the the you know the the art form the medium of comics and the possibilities that there are with it and that's why he was his passion for that was what led to his formal experimentation so every single comic that he's done you know you think from hell he's done this enormous big phone book sized comic that's all done with eddie campbell's scratchy artwork and the kind of and it's about magic and victorian murders and politics and religion and and if you if he pitched it to you you'd go like uh, it sounds bewildering but he's he's he has always formally experimented so like when he did big numbers that was like he was like right it's going to be square it's going to have like i don't know what did it have 16 panels a page or something it's yeah, got it crazy these big square comics and he he basically goes okay well if you have comics it's such an elastic medium push into every part of it and he's so passionate and so cheerful about so supportive of other creators he's so excited by artists he's so excited by um you know i would say that his work on abc comics um because he did he wrote the whole line and i remember when he was writing it he was like well i've got to do an issue of that by thursday and then i've got to get like i owe um zander can and gene har and i owe, I owe them 10 pages and I need to get another 10 pages of Tom Strong. I need to get, and he was, he was, you know, Rick Veach or a, his ABC work, I think stands up as proof positive of his love and delight for comics of all kinds. He absolutely, in that line, he had Promethea, which is like his mad experiment, like experimental investigation into magic and Bala and you know, um, yeah. all of his thoughts about that. And then you've got Top 10, which is a police procedural. And it's like, you can see in Top 10, he was madly into The Wire at the time. He was completely obsessed with The Wire and was like, would would tell me the plot of the episodes as he was watching them, like, oh, it was amazing. And he, he so he's, he, but he also, I remember him watching like Hill Street Blues in the 80s and being really into that and like, so you kind of, um, all of his kind of stuff that he's passionate about, he pushes all of that into his comics. Like he's, you know, Tom Strong is such a lovely archetypal character. He's such a kind of, um, the, you know, he's like a big Superman kind of guy, isn't he? And he's, he's got all of his, like, his, his cool base and his, uh, his wife and his daughter and his robot butler and his big gorilla, like, assistant. If you if you can read Tom Strong, and still think, well, Alan Moore, he's a he's a miserable old curmudgeon that hates comics and hates people and hates everything and like really yes because that's what that's what you get from Tom Strong. It makes me wonder if people either haven't read his stuff. The thing is, I know that there are there is a lot of his stuff that is problematic. There's stuff that like, you know, uh, I don't think I've read is um his stuff for avatar very much because it's a bit dark for me i'm i've i'm not really a big fan of lovecraft or, mm -hmm. yeah me too shocking but so. like i'm not john is he's he's, yeah. he's a huge fan of of lovecraft i'm i'm really not when i read it i'm like it, i just bounce off it it just doesn't vote but i don't think um i think if if you're talking about Alan Moore in terms of um, him being all he has ever done is stand up for his rights as a creator and by extension the rights of other creators he is only the reason he's had his name taken off the film and the you know he doesn't want his name anywhere on the Watchmen film or anything is because it's all been done after his explicit request that it not be done and him saying this is you've taken this this was mine and because it's massively profitable to you you want to milk it for everything you can i'm not going to be on board with that now the thing is he didn't say that 
Dave Gibbons couldn't put his name to it. He didn't say like he he is quite happy for Dave to be on board with it, respect him as a co-creator. He's not saying that everybody has to do what he does, but his personal his personal preference was that he get Watchmen back at the end when he when he expected mm -hmm. to. And the fact that he didn't, um he's He's angry about it. He was angry about it. I think he still is angry about it. And I think that the reason why he gets such a bad kind of press is because interviewers, when he sits, he agrees to do an interview with them based on, I don't know, Jerusalem coming out. Mm -hmm. He's so excited when Jerusalem comes out. He's worked on it for Christ knows how long, you know, every waking moment for 10 years or God knows what. And it comes out and he sits down with somebody and they say, so what do you think of Watchmen then? What do you think of the film? What do you think of the TV series? How do you feel about that? And he says, um, I, you know, he didn't want to talk about it. All he feels about it is that he hates it and wishes it hadn't happened. But because, because people want to know, oh, how angry is angry Alan Moore today? Is he going to shout in clouds and be angry old man Alan Moore? Let's like, let's see if he's still angry about it. And I like, he really, he was really, really um, hurt by what happened with him in comics. It was, it really hurt. Him. It was the thing that he was most excited about, most like, passionate about he literally poured his whole heart and soul into his work and for for them you know they flew him over they're so excited they took him to see Les Mis they like put him in a fancy hotel they're like oh my gosh this is amazing you know you've done Swamp Thing and V and Watchmen and it's like the you know the killing joke all these different the it was this bright shiny future of like amazing working for DC and then he's like oh well when I get it back then and then it that wasn't happening and I think that he felt completely betrayed and like heartbroken I think he was genuinely heartbroken that this it had gone not just uh, oh it's just you know just business I like he didn't come from a business background. He came from, you know, the, the poorest square mile of Northampton. Do you know what I mean? They mm -hmm. a, uh, a flush on their toilet. You know what I mean? It's a, it, he came from a background where people basically stuff was done like on your word. And it, everybody says, oh, he's so naive. God, how on earth did he not see that coming? Why on earth would he not be savvy enough to, there's a kind of like, um, puffed up, uh, you know, comics criticism is, oh, well, he should have, like, why was he so naive? And you go, well, because he was 25 and had been, like, told by a load of uh, flashy Americans in suits that they were going to, like, make all, it was all going to be amazing. And, you know, he had, he had money coming in. We bought a house. I can remember it so vividly. We went from living in a tiny council house, um, which, I mean, we didn't have an inside toilet in our council house. We had, I can very clearly remember that we'd like, we had a bath upstairs with no toilet. And you think that I was, that was the eighties, like, and I was sort of eight or something. And then all of a sudden the watchmen money came in and we bought a house and we had we had an upstairs and a downstairs loo. I don't know why this conversation has gone so toilet based, but <laughs> it's like in terms of what it represents to you as a family and as a person, like there are basic, basic facilities being easily accessible is like a giant thing, right? So all of a sudden he had this nice house. Um, we had a car, um, you know, we had like, it meant a massive deal to him professionally, financially, personally he could provide for his so this the the watchmen bubble was a huge huge deal and when when he had to break from dc he was saying 
it was a huge jump for him. Can you imagine doing that? You've got two kids and you're kind of like, you're basically saying, I don't want any more of that massive, well paying Mm -hmm. work. I'm I'm not, you know, one of the biggest publishers in, in the industry, I'm not going to work for you unless you do, you give me my characters back. And so all of the stuff that followed that with like the self publishing and everything, he, um, he was trying to sort of work out a way of doing it the way that he wanted to. And he tried to find collaborators that he could work with. And, you know, he continued to be as experimental as, as ever. And all of the stuff, all of his output after that, like the, the ABC line, he was going to do that with, um, uh, yeah. with Wildstorm. And then they got bought by DC and he was like, there was a point at which he was trying to work out whether to, he'd already signed the contract. He'd already said to them, I'll write you a whole line of comics. And then they got bought by DC and he'd sworn he would never write work for DC. He didn't want a single penny of his comics to put any more, you know, in, money in their coffers kind of thing. But he'd made a promise to Jim Lee that he would, write him a whole line of comics and all of the people that were involved in that whole line of comics all of their families all of their um you know their livelihoods this was a big deal for them to work with him for on this you know this was he knew it was like a it was going to secure their futures and their mortgages and their you know their lives and so he said okay I'm, i'll honor it i'll do that i'll do the the whole of ABC I will honor my promise to do it but I'm not happy with it I'm not happy with it like um and when he when he got to the end of it then that was that and I mean he kept League of Extraordinary Gentlemen that was creator own so he kept that but the rest has gone on to be written by other people as well and um I think did he keep I think he kept Promethea as well no uh DC's been using Promethea for like oh, is a, it? yeah they, dc used Prometheus a couple years ago oh okay in justice so, league yeah so basically he said that he um you know he said he'd go through with it because he didn't want that all the people involved to have it fall out from under them so i think that the the alan moore gets angry at literally anything and shakes his fist at a cloud and you know is furious about everything I've never known anybody so conscientious and so um, uh, to put so much thought into his decisions about his projects. And, you know, he isn't, he's anybody who's been to a signing and met him, he isn't aloof. He is a friendly guy in a jumper who would be very pleased if you gave him a packet of biscuits while you're at a signing with him. Do you know what I mean? He is yeah. a, a very, um, he's hilariously funny. I think a lot of his interviews and things are misquoted because they believe that he's like saying things with a straight face and nine times out of 10, he is being ridiculously tongue in cheek and sarcastic. And so like, yeah, I think when I, when I, <laughs> when I got quite angry on Twitter, basically I just, um, ever since I've been, on the internet, I remember I got my first, I was in university and I got um, a Hotmail address and I went online at, in an internet cafe where you could go and browse the internet for only several pounds an hour. Um, and the first site that I actually looked up was the only one that I knew, which was um, comiccon.com. I like, that was the only web address that I'd like mm-hmm. memorized off the top of my head. And uh, the first thing I looked for that was I think it was too much coffee, man. And I was, I sat there reading in my internet cafe with my hotmail address, feeling so modern reading, reading coffee, man. And uh, like, so I think the, um, but the internet since that point onwards has been saying, Alan Moore, Alan Moore's a grumpy old man. Alan Moore's a, a snooty, like thinks he's better than everybody. Oh, he's got enough money. Why does he need, you know this or what he's got why does he need that ip or why has he had his name taken off this why doesn't he just 
Watchmen himself. Why doesn't he like honest to God, I it's um I it's ridiculous the things people say about him and nine times out of ten it's just random people on the internet, so it's not a thing. Sometimes it's somebody that should know better and it's somebody that's kind of got more more sides of the story than just a random fan on the internet and that's when it upsets me is when it's somebody that I like you know that I know or that I kind of um am friends with and then I see stuff about him and I think he's not he's not on the internet he can't come on here and imagine oh my god if he was wasting time talking to people on twitter instead of writing jerusalem you know what i mean how much of jerusalem would have got written if he'd have been sat there having a intense discussion with somebody about the you know a footnote in from hell that they wanted to ask him about like i think basically he's not on the internet and i am and so when i see people giving him shit then it makes me angry it doesn't always make me angry most of the time it just is water off a duck's back but it was particularly because it was his birthday and on his birthday even though he's not on the internet i go on twitter and i say happy birthday to my dad he's a you know well done and like it, as much because other people do and people i get to post like stupid old pictures of him when he was a baby or whatever and everybody goes ah look at alan moore without a beard <laughs> he's a baby it's amazing and it's like a fun a nice little thing to do and I just went on and it was only about like eight o'clock in the morning here and everybody was already going well the 15 reasons I hate Alan Moore are I think that this and I think he has a it's just like really really guys like I don't need my timeline to be full of people saying why they think my dad's shit and i just like well i can't just sit there and go well, i think your dad's shit i bet i bet he does crap stuff i bet your dad's opinions about the world and literature and art and politics and everything are crap do you know what i mean like uh, everybody's dads are crap like i just like everybody even your dad that you love they're like they've done all stuff that's mad and random and you know what I mean? I just no, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I haven't punched anybody. <laughs> so that, I've just occasionally been slightly angry on the internet, but and very rarely, really rarely. That's that's one of the things that uh, that really gets to me sometimes is sometimes people will see an excerpt of what he said and then they'll overreact to it, but then I actually like mm. listen to his audio interviews and I'm like, that's not how he said it. Like he said it really, he said it really sarcastically. Like when, when there was one audio interview where he was talking about taking his name off of things. And then he said, oh yeah, as a point of principle, after V, I said, just take, I mean, wait, after League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I just said, take my name off of things. And then all of a sudden I get a call and then they said, oh, we've optioned Watchmen. And then I started crying and I told them, give Dave all the money. And I thought it was hilarious the yes. way he said it. But it's just the way that, uh, people yeah. react to these things. It's just you're not Alan yeah. Moore. Don't it's you? um, yeah. yeah. Well, he's like, it, I think he's sort of he he gets asked a lot of stupid questions and he tries to answer things. I think also uh, there's there's a lot more um, clicks to be gained from an explosive Alan Moore interview in which he pours scorn on the like the horrors of the comics world then it you know nobody's going to get many clicks through to their article if it just says alan moore quite enjoyed a book he read and really likes the wire Do you know that there is a like <laughs> a new kind of biscuit that he's particularly interested in that's got coconut in it and you go like i don't think anybody wants to read about nice alan moore i don't think anybody cares about nice enthusiastic like passionate friendly Alan Moore I think they want him all the pictures of him I do make a habit of saving the pictures that people draw of him because I think it's fascinating um it, I, I think it really reveals a lot about how they feel about him the way that they draw him 
So there's a lot of amazing pictures out there by incredible artists. But I always, I, I save them just because I'm like, that is literally how they see him. So I'm kind of, I'm interested in all the like, the sort of facets of him, if you like, that people see. Um, but nine times out of ten, they are like, you know, one big eye and one little eye, and like he looks like a kind of like angry Gandalf kind of, you know, like and sort of I am all powerful and I will destroy you and I'm like oh like that, but less angry and with the jumper and a cup of tea and like you know he's not even remotely the um uh, he likes to take pictures of himself where he looks. You know, all of his press pictures, he looks really angry and boggly and everything. But then, you know, he's not, even slightly, he's not. And if people want to ask him stupid questions about Watchmen, then he is going to be angry at them in the interview and they're going to get the column inches that they want saying angry Alan Moore shouts at clouds. But I think that people need to be aware that that is something that the people that ask the questions actively poke and prod him to get rather than just something that like he sat there at home going frothing mad about Watchmen. I think it's a real shame. I think that from what I've heard, the HBO series sounds like it's said some incredible stuff to do with like, you know, yeah. the Tulsa race riots and the, like all the stuff that people were talking about to do with it. And I've seen loads of people whose opinions, you know, I respect saying, it's an amazing series and it's, you know, it's really cleverly done. Um, I mean, I think it's a shame that we're at a point where he isn't, you know, if you think that is how amazing that's written, how amazing would it have been if he'd written it? What would his follow-up have been? You know, what if there'd been another, he had another six books of Halo Jones plotted in his head he sat down and told Neil Gaiman um, that Neil Gaiman had come round. He was like, well, what would you do if you, if you carried on with Halo Jones? And he said, oh, well, what I'd do is, and he said, he sat there, Neil Gaiman said that he sat there and heard the plot of six books more of Halo Jones that would have been in the world now. And they won't because you know because and you just the think same thing, yeah. what a waste what a waste how much more yeah and how much more how much more money would they be making if it's a financial decision where they're like well we can't give them the rights back because we'd you know we make our money from that then you think well you'd have made loads more you know what i mean you would have all that when i see all the layoffs at dc and how much trouble dc is in at the moment i'm just like uh, it makes me so furious and sad because there's a lot of amazing, talented people that have just been completely, you know, um, yeah, just thrown aside. And you just think that is, is outrageous. But I just can't help but wonder how much more robust the comics industry and those companies in particular, how much stronger they would be with him on their side. I think as far as like, um, you know, I'm not saying that he's the be all and end all, but when you look at the Amazon rankings, you know, Watchmen, is, does it fall out of the top 10 in graphic novels? Like, I, you think if that is what is propping up their business model, they, even they must realise that, that, you know, the angry Alan Moore hates comics, hates everything, hates them, why not be less of a jerk to him? Sort something out. He'll write a load of comics. Everybody be happy. You know, I, yeah, I, I <laughs> it's not a healthy fantasy for me to have because um, it's not going to happen. But it's one of those things where I just kind of, I've it's, got, not, it's yeah. not the world that he wanted to end up in. Of course. Well, and I think, Anybody that's angry with him for depriving them of his comics by, you know, when he says, oh, I'm not writing comics anymore, I'm not writing for DC, I'm not writing superheroes, I'm not writing, you know, and all of his anger and scorn about all of it is just based on the fact that comics went, oh, Alan Moore had a brilliant idea and then we stole it off him 
and then we made a load more things like it and then a load more things based on it and then a load more things like that and then we get to 2020 and he's like well I, I would have had a load of other ideas like Watchmen was a satire Watchmen was like a takedown of the ridiculous puffed up like um hyperbole of the of the superhero as a concept and like isn't Batman like you know if you take Batman is like a warped individual with a terrible past who's had like a, a you know he's traumatized and has the <laughs> so what happens if you take that to the nth degree then you end up with Rorschach and if you take Superman to the nth degree then you end up with Dr Manhattan if somebody has ultimate power and they can go to the other side of the world and lift a train then you end up with Dr Manhattan who can like vaporize people and so it was kind of his it was a comment on it and now it's gone oh well that's what that's what all comics should be that's what all superheroes should be they should all be super twisted gritty like and you go why what who what what is what is good about people being all messed up and like angry about everything and he he feels responsible even now he's like it was just going to be like a you know a 12 issue mini series and then we'd get on to the next it was a limited series it wasn't supposed to like get this big take over become the only thing that anybody talked about he was i, I had a conversation with him the other day because i was i was talking to him about my dust stuff and i was saying to him about trying to make each of the stories its own little its own style and a different artist and a different way of telling the story and um and i said it's brilliant because it means it's like an anthology but i'm writing all of them so i get to kind of show off all of the things that make me excited about comics you know formal aspects of like layouts and ways of playing with like sound effects or balloons or whatever and he said well he said that that was the approach that he'd always taken was that each one of his projects was to show that he could do that one thing incredibly well so that's why he's got like from hell lost girls like you know watchmen jerusalem he's like if i'm going to do that i'm not just going to try i'm going to do 300 pages of it and it's going to be the best thing ever but he like he he kind of do and you think well i would re i really wish that there was sort of a, a timeline where he'd have been allowed to do that kind of experimentation you know and put out 10 more 10 more watchmen's but they're all completely different and they're all they're not all about like how everything's messed up and you know they're not all this nihilist 80s kind of gritty um because that wasn't his plan he didn't you know want everything to be nihilist 80s gritty nonsense forever that was just one book that he was writing as a reflection of the horrible thatcherite like reagan administration misery you know the sort of military you, the, the regime that we were all living under in the 80s so he wrote watchmen to go this is bad look how horrible it is this is like you know a clever commentary on it with using the medium of superheroes and then everyone went that is literally all we need to know about comics forever <laughs> and just ran off with it for like 30 years and you go guys that's why which is why which is why it's so wonderful and refreshing that now um a lot of the a lot of the anti alan moore chat that i see online um i completely understand because a lot of it is like well you know how um people that don't don't aren't excited by watchmen or or from hell or whatever and they're like well they're you know there's just a load of old white guys you know who aren't kind of you know that there's nothing to do with me it's got i'm i'm not represented this doesn't make sense to me and they want to make their comics different to that and i think to be honest if if watchmen turn has turned into the establishment and that is what you know that is what you're pushing back against then more power to them because that's what he would want that's what like he he would want people to be you know to feel represented and to feel like excited by the comics that they read and he'd want people to be trying it themselves and 
you know, he's, um, yeah, he's absolutely besotted with the medium of comics and completely hates the industry. And that's a sad, it's a sad position to, to wind up in for somebody who could have, who did so much for it and could have done so much more. I think it's really sad. So, yeah, but... The, the the Watchmen love. I mean, I I love Watchmen as well, but it's just even he didn't write that way again after Watchmen. No, no, it was really clever. There's loads of it's brilliant to use as a teaching tool if you're talking about comics in a classroom, and you can say like, oh, you know, this is a good example. It's a brilliant example to use for all kinds of like visual techniques and how to tell comics how to tell a story in pictures there's loads of brilliant stuff in there but you know he doesn't think that every every comic should be watchmen he doesn't think everybody should have you know um and i think that you know a lot of the alan moore anti alan moore chat is like how dare he puff himself up to this degree he is so vain and like how dare he think of himself in these grand terms and you go well he's literally done nothing except try and innovate and include as many people as he can in that experiment and you know he's done his best do you know what i mean for a for a, a kid that got basically thrown into the middle of a crazy kind of big media circus that he had no idea. Comics was not, you know, comics was nothing. Comics was nothing. There was no way you could get rich in comics. There was no way you could get a fandom in comics. His, his basic dream was that maybe one of his comics heroes like Jack Kirby might read one of his comics and think it was cool. That was his main, that was his dream. He wasn't like, I'm going to make, he thought if he could make a living, started Watchmen, he was still writing Maxwell the Magic Cat strips for our local paper. He yeah. was still drawing. I can remember him sitting at his drawing table and drawing his little strips one a week because he would get like, I think he got 30 quid for a Maxwell the Magic Mac, uh, Cat strip. And that was, that was enough. Like if he got, did that and he did some other things and then he'd get, and that was enough to pay the rent and the bills. And so it was, he was trying to earn a living so that he could do something that he was passionate about and pay for his kids and his, you know, his life and everything. And the rest of it, the whole of the rest of it blew up. Um, and he did not expect it. And he is never, ever, that's why he's not like excited about awards or about kind of, he's, he's freaked out by the whole circus of it. He's freaked out by what, what he came to represent to people and by what his work as like this shining kind of monolith of perfection or whatever or uh, like a pompous you know a pretentious thing that he he was trying to give them he he's always just trying to be experimental and find new fun ways to tell stories and that is what makes him happy and passionate and excited and that is what he's lost from comics being such a garbage fire of an industry and I think that it's a loss to comics and I think it's a loss to you know his collaborators who you know have all done such amazing work with him and I think you know all all that he would want is for everybody to stop buying Watchmen and start buying all the amazing comics that everybody's making. I mean, uh, he wouldn't buy Watchmen because I suppose he's, <laughs> he's still su supporting him, but it's like, um, yeah, he's, he, he definitely does not shout at clouds, put it that way. He doesn't. Can I can I tell you what he personally means to me, and then maybe you can show it to him if. Uh... Yeah. So in 1998, I was down to collecting only two comics, and I was thinking because I was 16, 17, and I was thinking mm -hmm. maybe I have outgrown everything. Uh, and then 1999 hit, and ABC wow. happened, and it's just 
it was just the thing and it wasn't it was him and it wasn't just him it was just the sheer variety of artists mm -hmm. and strips and the fact that you know it's all coming out of the mind of like all of these different tones and different uh ideas coming out of the mind of one guy like and that yeah. was when i knew like i would love comics like forever yeah and abc told you that you were it was okay for you to be interested in all of those things and excited by all of the the, the artwork on it like uh splash brannigan and smacks and like um you know like all the crazy you just go it's abc his abc line is absolutely boggling i'm so glad that that's what like that's what um that you got from it because it's um well, it's it's also not just that. Um, I was also going through. I was raised Roman Catholic, but I was going through a crisis of faith at the time that Promethea number seventeen came out, and that was okay. like when that came out. When I read it, I was like, it it answered a lot of questions for young eighteen year old me. That was uh, twenty years ago. So, uh, which one was? This? It's the one. It's the one where they go to, wait, I'll just pull it out. Yeah, that whole shelf is Alan Marsh. <laughs> it's just, there's so many books. I know, well, he sends me a copy of everything. So my, my house is like lagged with Alan Moore books. So I'm like, oh my God fall over and crush me it's this one yes and when uh, sh she says down there there's light at the bottom and that was when like it just settled my mind uh, a lot and i'd like to thank yeah. your dad for that oh well i will pass that on no he's that's the thing with with promethea he kind of really explore uh, a lot of really incredibly big heavy dense kind of ideas that you kind of uh, it's it's the perfect medium to do that it's the perfect medium to talk about things to do with you know iconography and representation of you know gods and religion and, and the sort of what they mean to people and what they i think it's um yeah, he'd be so pleased to hear that. He's he, Promethea is one of the things I think he's proudest of. So he'd be delighted to hear that. And that that is, you know, Jim Williams. Yeah. I I can't believe that he he drew me. He drew <laughs> Wild Girl, and then he yeah. Um, he's a lovely guy as well. He's so lovely. Like you know. I was gonna say, um, your first comic drawn by Sean McManus and Jim Williams. That's yes yeah it was downhill from there <laughs> amazing it's amazing <laughs> no it like i mean it literally was we had to kind of um after we did wild girl um then we ended up doing a lot more um like indie comics and kind of we did a load of kind of um small press stuff in the uk so my kind of comic career was like right in at the top and then went and i need to sort of work out like how to write comic because I had no idea. Like, like what you know, have where do people go? What conventions do they go to? Like comics friends. I didn't have like a little bubble of people that I hung about with or anything. So the next ten years was a hundred percent just kind of like um, doing the legwork that you'd normally do before you got to Wild Girl. Mm -hmm. So we started at the top, like nosedived traumatic, and then it has been like really steady steady work to get back back up kind of thing so and i think that the doors the doors book is kind of i feel like it's a really nice natural kind of it feels like a good fit for me it doesn't feel like something that is like too difficult or anything it feels like something i can get my teeth into and yeah everything but yeah um, yeah um, when people say Oh, yeah. you know, how did you get into comics? Or what's it like being Alan Moore's daughter? And I'm like, do you have a good couple of hours <laughs> and a beer? <laughs> I'm, 
I've got a couple more comments because I know I've taken up a lot of your time. Um, so the first one is when you were talking about 1969, finding 1969 and finding ways for it to resonate with, uh, with today. Uh, th I watch a lot of, a lot, I watch a lot of NBA and uh, there's a saying in the NBA that says you can't run away from the DNA, which is to right. say that if you're, you know, if you're related to somebody, uh, then they're, you know, that's going to show in you. And while you were describing it, I was like, oh, that sounds a lot like from hell, actually, like the, the, the approach from hell. So I thought that was, that was interesting. So I'm not going to ask you what it's, what it's like being Alan Moore's daughter. You've probably been asked that a billion times, but. Um, I think you've got a sense of it anyway. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking so forward to the Doors book. It's one of my favorite bands of all time. And you got you sound like you've got a heck of a killer artist's lineup. So. Yes. And thank well, you for all that personal info about, about uh, your dad. That's, um, I'm glad to get that out there. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> everybody always says, what's it like being Alan Moore's daughter? And usually I just say, ah, oh, it's all right. You know, I quite enjoy it. And sometimes I say, more. <laughs> so thank you for asking. And uh, I think I'm going to go play this now. <laughs> yes, go and play okay. it. Tell me. I actually got the um, got the level that wrote. I got it wrong. <laughs> 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 so please tell me if you if you do better than I did. You got your own mystery. <laughs> and I wrong? knew what happened, so you know. How'd that happen? I don't ask. <laughs> I was sat there and I was like, did that did we put it that what? hang on a minute? What? <laughs> Oh, that's unfair if they put in a revision after you left. That's just It's a cool fair. game though. They do they do a really good job on it. Thank you so much, Leah. I'll uh put this up um pretty soon. Okay. Okay.